I'm Elizabeth Eve King. And I'm Andrea Goyan. Today, we are beyond excited to have Neil Clark of Clark's World Magazine joining us. If you've just emerged from a cocoon, Neil is the editor of the Hugo and World Fantasy Award-winning Clark's World Magazine, as well as several anthologies, including Best Science Fiction of the Year series. He's been nominated and or has won almost every award you've ever heard of and has established Clark's World only started in 2006 as one of the premier science fiction magazines in just 16 years. Neil, congratulations on your recent Hugo win for Best Editor Short Form. It is well-deserved. Yes, can you show us your Hugo for those of us? It is right here. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. Wow. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> let, me, uh, cool. let me grab it, get it closer to the camera for you. Please. So, so oh, it says nice. scale That's up. A... It doesn't fit nice. this way, so maybe this way, but. <laughs> <laughs> And it's sitting next to your your robot. My my pet very, robot, yes. Your pet robot, very cool too. What's it say on the on the front of? Oh, robot? he's made the robot is actually made of uh, recycled materials, so that's a coffee can. Oh, cool. very cool! I love it's that. It's an I artist who, uh, outside of um, Pittsburgh. I I got that at the Nebulas one year when they were in Pittsburgh. Very, cool. love it. I love it. I like recycled recycled robots. Yeah, he he makes a whole bunch of them. I have I have two of them. <laughs> oh, cool. So, how how do you start a magazine, and then how did you? Because to me, it's like Clark's World has always been way up there, like super established, super you know Clark's World da 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 but it's only been around since 2006 which when I found that out I was really kind of shocked how how did you do that uh <laughs> well yeah simple question yeah, yeah. The, well the funny thing is that that uh I, I, you know that one night I wasn't going to be an editor and had no no aspirations whatsoever and then the next night I was one um it, it was one of those uh uh, conversations at a, a science fiction convention uh, that caused this. Uh, so Sean Wallace and I met at ReaderCon and we're talking about online fiction markets and why so many ha were closing sci fiction, the sci fi channels magazine that was edited by Ellen Datlow had recently closed. And we were doing this sort of post mortem on why, why things weren't uh, working at the time. Uh, uh, I was running an online bookstore and I was I had online fiction as samples from several magazines, including Sean's. Um, and my background is also in technology, uh, technology and education more specifically. Um, so that's what I was uh, you know, doing at the time. And the two of us were bouncing ideas back and forth. And by the end of the evening, we had this business plan we thought would work. And by the end of the weekend, we had a full staff. And three months later, we had our first issue. And wow. we haven't missed a, a date since. Um, there have been some tough times. Uh, the first first couple of years, um, online fiction markets weren't very uh, respected. Uh, uh, we'd have authors tell us, uh, "No, we that's only for newbie authors. We we won't publish with you." Um, and uh, you know, then a few years later, that all evaporated, and and uh, online fiction started getting noticed. Like years best anthologies were starting to include it more often, and um, awards were beginning to to recognize the stories. So uh, it's come a long way since then. And we were, in some ways, uh, part of uh, the secret to our success was timing. Uh, we were in there just as the wave was was uh, about to crest, but we've also adopted all new technologies uh, as they've become available. So we were the third science fiction magazine in in Amazon's Kindle subscription program. Um, Analog and Asimov's were the only two to beat us. And then um, uh, in, with Patreon, we were the first science fiction magazine in there, maybe even the first magazine. I don't remember any others before us. Um, so all of these little things here and there, uh, we're not afraid to try things out. We, we, and some of them don't work. We, there was a, a service that was doing podcasting, um, uh, a podcasting app that, that, uh, we were one of their pilot people in the program and sponsored or not sponsored, but highlighted. And they went under in, in like 
eight months. Um, so, you know, not everything works out the way you want, but, uh, you know, it, it all piles up and being, um, you know, we had uh, uh, one of our philosophies was to go where the readers are um, instead of, we, you can't expect them to come to you. So uh, we make sure we're available in every format. Um, that there's interest in. So when stone tablets come back into fashion uh, in the next retro wave, uh, we might have to do that. Um, but you know, it, it caused us to jump into podcasting as a as an example um, because we knew there was a large audience of people who will not read; they will listen. Did Did you start out as a pro market originally? Did we were pay, right? so so it depends on how you define pro <laughs> i i tend to say no but we were paying 10 cents a word right. um uh, my definition for pro falls more in line with what the yugos do in saying that you should that, that the editors and staff pay also matter um oh. whereas mm -hmm. you know uh, uh the a lot of people will just conflate sif was qualifying rate with being a professional right Right. right. And now, how did you start paying? I'm sorry. Go ahead. How did you start paying right away? Well, uh, it was attached to the to the bookstore. Um, so it, we did it the old fashioned way. We, we invested uh, some of our own money in, into it, um, but it was tied to the bookstore. And I used it. I, I uh, counted it as a marketing expense to put some in there. We also started small. Um, you know, the size of the magazine now is 45,000 words of fiction plus nonfiction and, and cover art. When we started, we were two stories and a cover. And the two stories were 4,000 words or less. So our budget was a lot smaller. And as we gained readership and other revenue streams, we expanded uh, to fit that. that makes sense. And how long have you been doing new fiction, nonfiction? I'll let you ask the, the next question. Oh, the nonfiction started in our second year. Um, I, um, our okay. first year, uh, we ended up uh, with positive revenues, so we uh, sure. decided to expand a little, and and that was the first place we did it. That's cool. Um, one of the questions that um, someone asked me to ask you was, uh, what percentage of the spots in the magazine are invitational, and what come out of the flush the slush fund group? Can't All talk. of them are slush. Uh, we we do not invite anybody. So if you see somebody you recognize, they went through the same process everyone else did. And do you, when you're when you're deciding at the end with your slush file, I keep saying file pile, your slush mm -hmm. pile of maybe stories. Does someone's presence online matter, or is it all about the story? Uh, uh, no, it's it's about the story. Uh, it's it, right. that. I, I'm pretty adamant about that one. It's it's not the like I don't even pay attention to who the author is most of the time i mean i might notice i don't i read the cover letter after the submission because it, it can quite often the cover letters are so bad they can bias you against the story um you know so th there's a um it, we're really happy when we get to work with somebody we've never worked before um uh, and we're really happy when we get to work with somebody who's coming back it, i mean it works out for us no, no, no matter what because we're really more more interested in the story uh, than anything else. So why are the cover letters so bad? What are people doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the worst offense is to put a summary in the story uh, of the story. I'm going to read the story. So don't tell me, no spoilers. Don't ruin it for me. Um, you know, th there's some people that announce how a story is going to end. And that just is terrible to do to an editor who's evaluating your work. Um, I want very little in a cover letter. And I, I actually uh, wrote something up that says there's really only two things I need to know. One is English your first or second language is English your second language. Um, because I'm I'm I might give you give it a second read if I think I was being too nitpicky over language, uh, if that's the case. And the other one is that if you're you're under 18, aside from needing to know for contract purposes. Um, you know, they're having come out of academia and, and working with with, uh, you know, students and, and and younger, younger people. It's something that I, you know, try to be conscious of uh, when we're reading it, They might not be as experienced, but quite often they surprise me when they say, yeah. say, I, I'm, I'm 16 and I'm reading the story and I'm going, no way I would have ever, ever guessed. Um, yeah. There's a certain um they 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 have something I didn't have when I was that age, 
uh, just the bravery of sending that work out there is is something worth worth noting. Well, and now you can do it online most of the time, mm -hmm. so that's great. I mean, I, we we interviewed a little while ago um, Rosalind um, Helfand from the Omega Festival here in LA, and they do a whole thing where they work with kids in the school, and a whole section of the contest is for teenagers. And mm -hmm. I've listened to the kids' stories, and they're amazing. They're mm -hmm. often better than the adults. <laughs> I said it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's exciting. Um, I have another question. How, this is personal, how do you get through your, your slush pile so quickly? Because everyone really appreciates the fact that even though you're not, you can't do simultaneous submissions, you get through it fast, whereas some mm. markets take four or five months with no simultaneous submissions. Yes, I, 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 I that's my question too. Yes. Usually, it's, it's math. It's like... <laughs> no, it, it's it's, it's simple math. You know how many are coming in. You know how many you have to read in a day. Um, th you follow the averages. It's kind of funny. P markets that stay a, a consistent three months, they're actually turning over the right amount of stories. It's just they've fallen so far behind. Um, that they're never they're not gaining ground. Um, so it was a priority to us that uh, those stories are paychecks, potential paychecks for the authors. It's respectful to turn it around as quickly as possible so that they can get it off to the next market and and perhaps have it land where it should. Um, now the uh, um, uh, but we have a few slush readers on, on, on team. Right now there's one, but sometimes there's as many as five. Um, but I, I'm still first reader on, on anywhere around 60% or more um, uh, on, on the average because I feel it's important to keep um, my feet in that pool. Um, I view, uh, I view uh, our slush team as more of an academic experience for them. So I'm primarily looking for people who want to be uh, writers or, or who are writers <laughs> or want to be editors um, uh, because I think there's some useful things that they can pick up from that experience. So since, since you're, sorry, Elizabeth, I keep asking questions. Since you're the first reader, um, another question someone asked me was, what do you feel like the personality of your publication is versus some of the other speculative markets out there? Oh, I'm probably the worst person to ask that because I, I okay. don't, people ask me what a Clark's world story is and I don't know. It's, it's the stories I like is, is the worst possible response to that uh, because it's meaningless. Um, <laughs> it really doesn't help anyone. Um, but the problem is that it's a moving target. Uh, so it's influenced by everything I read, either in, in the slush pile or in another magazine or in another genre, even. Um, uh, so it, I never really know what it is I'm looking for until I find it. Uh, so it's that sense of, uh, discovery that when you're reading through the slush, there's the stories that sort of jump out at you. This, um, I tell the slush readers that I want to see stories that make them think or feel, uh, because there's something about that story that's engaged you. Uh, I want the story you're going to remember the next day. Um, because when you're reading 1,100 stories a month, they all blur together. Um, so the, on the plus side, I don't remember any of the stories I reject. Um, so <laughs> I've not, and, and it's nothing, the plus side is for the authors because I've had them come up to me at conventions and say, I'm so sorry I sent you that terrible story, um, you know, from early in their career or whatever. And I'm like, I don't remember. Every story is a clean slate. Um, you know, so, you know, you might feel that last one was absolutely terrible, but I'm still reading the next one as if it's the first story I've seen by you. Um, so it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, advantageous to, to, uh, be a little for forgetful in that. <laughs> so when you, so you give it the first read, usually like 60% of the mm -hmm. time, then you just sort of save up all the second choices and give them another read or do you have another reader do that no or? so the um the second round uh which is about two percent of all submissions um sean and i will go go through those uh together um and sean also does some of the first reading 
Um, uh, and when I was away at the convention, he carried the weight of, weight of the load for me, which was very, very much appreciated. Um, but the um, uh, the process tends to be that I'll read a story multiple times, um, several days apart. Um, uh, and basically, that's me trying to find, uh, kick the tires, find uh, what's working, what's not working. Was it just a novelty um, that caught my attention or is there something really here? Um, uh, and, you know, it'll it'll go around over the course of anywhere from from two weeks to to a month and a half. Uh, on average uh, for, for that tier. Uh, and then uh, I'll sit down in, I'm probably going to do it again tomorrow or, uh, or tonight, um, go through the ones that are in the second round and just say, okay, but which ones, but it's, it's time to, to kick everyone out of the pool. Um, and uh, which ones are we keeping and which ones are we, we giving the near miss letters to. Uh, and do so, you, when, with the, with each publication of the magazine, do you try, is there a feel to it? Are you trying to fit pieces together with the stories or is it just, I like this story. It may not go with this one, but I don't care because I like them. Okay. So when we're buying, no, we're not buying for a particular theme or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But when, when I'm assembling an issue, I'm looking at a number of factors and, you know, I, I want stories that play well together. I'm not framing a theme or anything like that, but I want, um, uh, stories that are compatible uh, to, to go together um, so that I'm not giving a reader whiplash going from one story to another. Um, I'm also paying attention to length because we do have um, 45,000 words to fill. So if I have a novella, I'm going to need to pair it up with a few shorter pieces. Um, uh, so I'll have to, uh, so that might cause the uh, um, a shorter work or a longer work to sit in inventory longer while we find pieces to pair with it. Uh, but generally, we don't keep more than three months of inventory at any given time. And do you, uh, what, the, how, what percentage of the second round gets accepted? Uh, I don't know what it is by percentage, yeah. but the actual uh, rate of what's accepted is below a percent. It, it's something like maybe 0.5 or something like that. Um, it, it'll vary month to month uh, a bit. Uh, I did, I do a lot of, um, statistical analysis of our slush pile so on my blog people can find a whole bunch of of uh things usually at the start of a year i'll i'll do an analysis but i did one um that was uh, the funnel uh so first round second round published by genre um which was kind of interesting because i animated it over the course of of, of uh, a few years to get a sense of what was going on with the publication i'm tr i try to uh um evaluate myself on a number of criteria <laughs> so I do pay attention a lot to the statistics behind it plus again my background being in technology um I'm I'm a, da a bit of a data junkie so and you said your background was in technology for like teaching technology can you oh uh, yeah I, I worked in yeah. academia for over 20 years as um um, it, it never really had an official title when I started, but I was the person who helped integrate technology into the curriculum. Um, and at, at varying times, I was uh, sometimes I might have been in charge of technology for the for a school or or in charge of all of academic technology at a university. Um, but most of the time, it was um, uh, heavily involved in in uh, curricular integration and things like that. That was my my area of specialty uh, that I sort of. I think I spent most of my career doing that. At the university level? At K-12 and university level. Typically university, but I did, I did, uh, I've taught it, uh, and I've also worked in the classroom. Um, I haven't taught full-length classes, but I've taught single sessions. Um, so I've actually worked with students from, from like three years up to um, uh, an, uh, like a 90-year-old professor getting tutored. So <laughs> Um, wow. it, yeah, there's only one classroom I won't step into, and that's a seventh grade classroom. I there's, hear there you. There are reasons. I, they are <laughs> awful. Terrible age. I hear you. I had a I had a year teaching middle school that I'm surprised. Then you know. Not, uh, yes, I do. I do. I was like, wow. I teach little. I've taught old, mm -hmm. and middle school is just like, no. Yeah. yeah. So sure. I get it. Now. 
you also have, did you also start with, because you have narrated your stories or Kate has narrated mm -hmm. your stories on the website. Was that right from the get-go too, or did you add that in? Because that's a really nice, I think that's a really great thing, additional thing. Like now you have, you know, it, it's just grown exponentially, obviously non fiction as well as this narration where you can listen mm -hmm. uh, we didn't start off doing that it's something we added uh, uh you know a few years in at first we were just doing one story from each issue and eventually it worked up to doing all of them um and uh, uh and we were also we also started with a, a few narrators and after a while uh after after working with kate a few times i offered her the position as a a permanent thing. I think it was probably one of the smartest tires I've made uh, uh, because she's she's been uh, rather consistent and she is the voice of Clark's world at this point. Yeah, that's great. So if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? I think I already listened to it. Don't listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to tell you you can't do it. And and uh, the number of people who have told me I can't do things, uh, either in my old career or this one, like when we announced we were starting the magazine, people, people who I know who were in publishing were going, it'll be dead in a year. <laughs> You know, it's like, well, thank you. And, and maybe that's what encouraged me to try even harder because, you know, telling me that it just made me stubborn and, and it's like, no, we're going to make it. Um, but, um, you know, it, things work themselves out. And I think the lesson uh, that, that, uh, that I learned much later, thanks to some, so I had a heart attack 10 years ago. Um, and the one thing that I learned out of that was life's too short to work, to let things, uh, stick with you. And I think I would have I've been happier in my earlier, in my first 40 years, if I, if, uh, if I had understood that more firmly. So sure. I'm not sure that's something you could tell your younger self and have them believe it, but I would try at least. That's yeah. True. Younger selves are kind of the seventh graders. Mm, yes. <laughs> uh, the younger selves are like, yeah, I don't hear you. <laughs> so. so thank you so much for yeah. talking with us. It's been fabulous, and we always end with the best thing we learned this week. Mm -hmm. So my best thing, I usually start, my best thing is that uh, the word cat comes from the Latin catula, which is Latin for little dog. So the word cat comes from the word dog. Mm -hmm. And I talked to about, I interviewed about five cats on the subject, and they all we're very, very dismissive and say they much prefer ancient Egyptian to Latin. So <laughs> very that's good. Mine. Very good. Mine is is the first one anyways, very small. It rained here and we are overjoyed. I was out at a concert last night in the rain and we were all out there getting wet. And that in LA right now is almost a miracle. So we're very happy. So, Neil. Hmm. So, so um, because of that heart attack I mentioned, I pay a lot of attention to some some of the uh, the science surrounding replacement organs, uh, particularly three D printing organs. Uh, mm -hmm. And recently, I just came across one one of the big problems is developing vascularized tissue. Um, and this this goes a little into the weeds, um, but it's really in, in short, it's it's for nutrient transport and and waste uh, removal or disposal or whatever, um, and and it's it's one of those obstacles that they need to to overcome. And somebody uh, had just uh, I was reading an article, uh, a, a principal study, uh, where they where they've managed to create um, uh, tissue that was ten times larger than than previous and with uh, uh vascularized and it could function for up to six weeks which is you know six weeks isn't all that useful for for me if i want a new heart someday but um where that can really benefit in the short term is drug testing um so because now they can um you know you stem cells produce human tissue and test various drugs on them so this is kind of a fascinating area of science that 
Um, uh, there's people that believe that a decade out, we will actually start seeing uh, replacement organs that are grown, non-rejectable because they'll be from your own stem cells. Oh, wow. Yeah. It that's, gets, it, it, yeah the conversations I have with my cardiologist about this stuff are kind of fun. He, he once suggested that it gets even better. You go further out into the future. And he's a science fiction fan too, um, because they could grow it in your chest. Um, wow. uh, it, How would they do that? It, it, the science is past my, my understanding at that point, but you know, it, it, it is stem cells and stem cells uh, can be, um, uh, it, it almost feels like magic when people are talking to me about them. It's, it, uh, but it is uh, uh, stuff that is being researched in, in either 3D printing or just growing the organs themselves um, is a fascinating area of, of research. And there's always something new going on there. So I was kind of kind of happy to see that they had made some significant progress, assuming yeah. it pans out. I mean, it is just a, a uh, an initial uh, part of the study. So, wow, that's fascinating. Pan out, but in time, so. trying to. I can imagine printing an organ, but I can't imagine how you grow it in your chest. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just incredible. Yeah, at what point do you have two hearts? Are they attached? Uh, you know, well, that's that, all. That's, two brains. That's... <laughs> You've got two brains, and they're like, and how does it fit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah how does it like... fit? <laughs> like, well, what point do you take one? Yes. Yeah. Well, he, I, he, I know. He, go ahead. No, I was going to say I know when you take out um, it's a different organ, but mm -hmm. it's what is it? It's a liver transplant. They leave the old one in. Mm -hmm. I think it's the liver. Because I have someone I knew who and she's like, oh, I still have the the one the one that doesn't work is left in. Mm -hmm. They never take it out. That's what I, she told me. I mean, that, I think there's mm. something about the, it's it's harder on your body and the, the removal of it. Because it's usually harder on the donor than the receiver when you do a transplant like that, mm -hmm. a liver. Is it? So, so someday we'll have like two hearts or two brains. Or... <laughs> well, he yeah. was saying that they would cut the old heart out. Like they would minimally invasive surgery and they could go in and pull it out in little pieces. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah. That's, yeah. Talk about science fiction. I mean, yes. pulling the heart out in little pieces is just what happens to what mm -hmm. the, some of the pieces that remain, you know? Well, they, they, they would, I guess both would be connected to you at the same time. Again, this, now I'm, now I'm just theorizing because, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm assuming that they'd both be connected and they would just close off the connection to the other one and then they could remove it. So for a while, you might have two hearts beating or. Yeah, um, you'd be a, a time lord. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, the man, wasn't there a man with two brains or something? If there wasn't, there certainly should have been. It sounds like one of those old movies, The Crawling Hand. I think that was a Steve Martin brain. movie. <laughs> was it? <laughs> hey, that sounds about right. So we want to thank you again so much. Yeah. So, and we want to thank uh, Maria Korloff for producing and Alex Korloff for editing. Absolutely. And then we want to tell our viewers that if you enjoyed this, please like it and leave comments below. We'd love to know what you're thinking about. And subscribe to our channel if you don't want to miss any episodes. And if you want to help support Metastellar, the publication, you can visit our Patreon page and donate to us and all the monies there go to pay for original fiction so thank you so much and thank you again neil it's been really fun getting You're to welcome. hear more about the magazine thank so thank you we'll see you all next time a little zoom wave bye zoom wave <laughs>